Welcome to Liberty Star Tan. <laughs> we are going to be reading a story. But first up, we are going to be doing the Bible verse of the day, and then we're going to be reading the Bible, and then we're going to go. Now we're going to do synapses. Do, 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 do Shally Whip. And then we're going to be reading Shally Whip. So, if you can join me, to hit the like button. Subscribe and hit the bell and name a new video. <laughs> oh, you think you're so funny. You think you're so funny. You think your brain's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope you guys enjoy. Let's head straight into Matthew 6, 3 through 5. Yo, silly. Matthew 6, 3 through 5. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what that your right hand what what your, what that your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will re reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they... <laughs> the hypocrites. Okay. The hypocrites, for they love in to stand and pray in the synagogues, and that the street corners they may be seen in well, they may be seen by others truly I say to you they have revealed the received received their reward <laughs> so I hope you like that I'm being giant ant hello how are you doing today? I'm about to read Micah. I think we're on chapter four. And this is the English Standard Version of the Bible. What's going on over there? Mom turned into a cat. Mom turned into a cat. <laughs> Ma what is that? What is that in Harry Potter? An animagus? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So, mom is an animagus. Not really. That cat's missing a leg. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, like I said, we are on Micah chapter four. We're a little giddy this evening, so let's just go ahead and begin. This is the English Standard Version. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each is each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been dri driven away and those whom I have afflicted, and the lame I will make the remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. 
And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished, that pain seized you like a woman in labor? Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, Let her be defiled, and let our eyes gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hoofs bronze. You shall beat in places many people... Sorry, beat in pieces many peoples, and shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. That is the end of Micah chapter 4. So, next time, which will probably be Sunday, maybe Monday, we will read Micah chapter 5. So, I hope that you are enjoying the reading of God's word and that he is blessing you in it. So, um, I also wanted to say, I did mention that it's probably going to be Sunday or possibly Monday. We are going to be driving and we will be away for a little while, but don't worry, we will be back. All right. And also front. So we don't have to speak out of the backside of our heads. We can speak from our mouths. So, all right. So, in the last chapter, um, there was a miracle, we already did that, a meeting, good progress, um, Charlotte was able to write the word terrific, which everybody knew that uh, Wilbur was already anyway, and then um, Mrs. Arable went to the doctor to check on her daughter Fern and the doctor rambled and rambled just like I do normally and um, uh, Mrs. Arable just fell asleep because what he said just didn't make any sense and it was incredibly boring and that is the end of you didn't kill anybody no, well, but I... she fell asleep no, I... she didn't die well, I... and then 10 seconds later there was a nuke Okay, here's Kimberly to say what really happened. I think I moved this too and close. And everyone died. Uh. Dad didn't kill everybody this time. I Yay! Know. I've only been killing Wilbur in this book. I know. You also killed Charlotte once. Did or I? twice. <laughs> You're killing a poor little <laughs> child. I knew so, so much child show up this place. So what actually happened was the doctor told Fern's mom that there really wasn't anything for her to worry about. And um, Wilbur is going to the fair. And the fair or what kind of fair? The state fair? The county fair. Oh, the county fair. And they're going to put him um, in a contest. I'm going to hand it off to Dad, who's going to read a story. Hello, my friends again. All right, so now we're on to chapter 15, which is called The Crickets. That's another good book we could read, The Cricket in Times Square. All right, so, I don't know, I just thought of that. Okay, chapter 15, The Crickets. The crickets sang in the grasses. They sang the song of summer's ending, a sad, monotonous song. Summer is over and gone, they sang. Over and gone, over and gone. Summer is dying, dying. 
The crickets felt it was their duty to warn everybody that summertime cannot last forever. Even on the most beautiful days in the whole year, the days when summer is changing into fall, the crickets spread the rumor of sadness and change. In San Antonio, we're pretty much ready for summer to be over. In late October, we're already we're still ready for summer to be over. Um, sorry, I'll get back. Everybody heard the song of the crickets. Avery and Fern Arable heard it as they walked the dusty road. They knew that school would soon begin again. The young geese heard it and knew that they would never be little goslings again. Charlotte heard it and knew that she hadn't much time left. Mrs. Zuckerman, at work in the kitchen, heard the crickets, and a sadness came over her, too. Another summer gone, she sighed. Lurvy, at work, building a crate for Wilbur, heard the song and knew it was time to dig potatoes. Summer is over and gone, re repeated the crickets. How many nights till frost, sang the crickets. Goodbye, summer, goodbye, goodbye. The sheep heard the crickets, and they felt so uneasy, they broke a hole in the pasture fence and wandered up into the field across the road. The gander discovered the hole and led his family through, and they walked to the orchard and ate the apples that were lying on the ground. A little maple tree in the swamp heard the cricket song and turned bright red with anxiety. Wilbur was now the center of attraction on the farm. Good food and regular hours were showing results. Wilbur was a pig any man would be proud of. One day, more than a hundred people came to stand at his yard and admire him. Charlotte had written the word radiant, and Wilbur really looked radiant as he stood in the golden sunlight. Ever since the spider had befriended him, he had done his best to live up to his reputation. When, when Charlotte's web said some pig, Wilbur had tried to look like some pig. When Charlotte's web said terrific, Wilbur had tried to look terrific. And now that the web said radiant, he did everything possible to make himself glow. It is not easy to look radiant, but Wilbur threw himself into it with a will. He would turn his head slightly and blink his long eyelashes. Then he would breathe deeply, and when his audience grew bored, he would spring into the air and do a backflip with a half twist. I didn't know pigs could do that. At this, the crowd would yell and cheer, How's that for a pig? Mr. Zuckerman would ask, well pleased with himself, The pig is radiant. Some of Wilbur's friends in the barn worried for fear all this attention would go to his head and make him stuck up, but it never did. Wilbur was modest. Fame did not spoil him. He still worried some about the future, as he could hardly believe that a mere spider would be able to save his life. Sometimes at night he would have a bad dream. He would dream that men were coming to get him with knives and guns, but that was only a dream. In the daytime, Wilbur usually felt happy and confident. No pig ever had truer friends, and he realized that friendship is one of the most satisfying things in the world. Even the song of the crickets did not make Wilbur too sad. He knew it was almost time for the county fair, and he was looking forward to the trip. If he could distinguish himself at the fair, and maybe win some prize money, he was sure Zuckerman would let him live. Charlotte had worries of her own, but she kept quiet about them. One morning, Wilbur asked her about the fair. "'You are going with me, aren't you, Charlotte?' he said. "'Well, I don't know,' replied Charlotte. "'The fair comes at a bad time for me. "'I shall find it inconvenient to leave home, even for a few days.' "'Why?' asked Wilbur. "'Oh, I just don't feel like leaving my web. "'Too much going on around here.' "'Please come with me,' begged Wilbur. "'I need you, Charlotte. "'I can't stand going to the fair without you. "'You've just got to come.' "'No,' said Charlotte. "'I believe I'd better stay home "'and see if I can get some work done.' "'What kind of work?' asked Wilbur. "'Egg-laying. "'It's time I made an egg sack and filled it with eggs.' "'I didn't know you could lay eggs,' said Wilbur in amazement. "'Oh, sure,' said the spider.' I'm versatile. What does versatile mean? Full of eggs? asked Wilbur. 
Certainly not, said Charlotte. Versatile means I can turn with ease from one thing to another. It means I don't have to limit my activities to spinning and trapping and, and stunts like that. Why don't you come with me to the fairgrounds and lay your eggs there, pleaded Wilbur. It would be wonderful fun. Charlotte gave her web a twitch and moodily watched it slay. Sway. Slay? I told you I'd be able to kill somebody. I'm afraid not, she said. You don't know the first thing about egg-laying, Wilbur. I can't arrange my family duties to suit the management of the county fair. When I get ready to lay eggs, I have to lay eggs, fair or no fair. However, I don't want you to worry about it. You might lose weight. Well, we'll leave it this way. I'll come to the fair if I possibly can. Oh, good, said Wilbur. I knew you wouldn't forsake me just when I needed you the most. All that day, Wilbur stayed inside, taking life easy in that straw. Charlotte rested and ate a grasshopper. She knew that she couldn't help Wilbur much longer. In a few days, she would have to drop everything and build the beautiful little sack that would hold her eggs. Chapter 16. Off to the Fair The night before the county fair, everybody went to bed early. Fern and Avery were in bed by eight. Avery lay dreaming that the Ferris wheel had stopped and that he was in the top car. Fern lay dreaming that she was getting sick in the swings. Lurvy was in bed by 8.30. He lay dreaming that he was throwing baseballs at a cloth cat and winning a genuine Navajo blanket. Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman were in bed by 9. Mrs. Zuckerman lay dreaming about a deep freeze unit. Mr. Zuckerman lay dreaming about Wilbur. He dreamt that Wilbur had grown until he was 116 feet long and 92 feet high, and that he had won all the prizes at the fair and was covered with blue ribbons and even had a blue ribbon tied to the end of his tail. Here is a picture of Mr. Zuckerman's dream. <laughs> That is some pig, right? <laughs> wow. All right. <clears throat> Down in the barn cellar, the other animals, too, went to sleep early, all except Charlotte. Tomorrow would be fair day. Every creature planned to get up early to see Wilbur off on his great adventure. When morning came, everybody got up at daylight. The day was hot. Up the road at the Arable's house, Fern lugged a pail of hot water to her room and took a sponge bath. Then she put on her prettiest dress because she knew she would see boys at the fair. Mrs. Arable scrubbed the back of Avery's neck and wet his hair and parted it and brushed it down hard till it stuck to the top of his head, all but about six hairs that stood straight up. Avery put on clean underwear, clean blue jeans, and a clean shirt. Mr. Arable dressed, ate breakfast, and then went out and polished his truck. He had offered to drive everybody to the fair, including Wilbur. Bright and early, Lurvy put clean straw in Wilbur's crate and lifted it into the pig pen. The crate was green. In gold letters, it said, Zuckerman's Famous Pig. Charlotte had her web looking fine for the occasion. Wilbur ate his breakfast slowly. He tried to look radiant without getting food in his ears. In the kitchen, Mrs. Zuckerman suddenly made an announcement. Homer, she said to her husband, I am going to give that pig a buttermilk bath. A what? said Mr. Zuckerman. A buttermilk bath. My grandmother used to bathe her pig with buttermilk when it got dirty. I just remembered. "'Wilbur's not dirty,' said Mr. Zuckerman proudly. "'He's filthy behind the ears,' said Mrs. Zuckerman. "'Every time Lurvy slops him, the food runs down around the ears. "'Then it dries and forms a crust. He, al "'He also has a smudge on one side where he lays in the manure.' "'He lays in clean straw,' corrected Mr. Zuckerman. "'Well, he's dirty, and he's going to have a bath.' "'Mr. Zuckerman sat down weakly and ate a doughnut. His wife went to the woodshed. When she returned, she wore rubber boots and an old raincoat, and she carried a bucket of buttermilk and a small wooden paddle. Edith, you're crazy, mumbled Zuckerman, but she paid no attention to him. Together they walked to the pig pen. Mrs. Zuckerman wasted no time. She climbed in with Wilbur and went to work. 
Dipping her paddle in the buttermilk, she rubbed him all over. The geese gathered around to see the fun, and so did the sheep and the lambs. Even Templeton poked his head out cautiously to watch Wilbur get a buttermilk bath. Charlotte got so interested, she lowered herself on a drag line so she could see better. Wilbur stood still and closed his eyes. He could feel the buttermilk trickle down his sides. He opened his mouth, and some buttermilk ran in. It was delicious. He felt radiant and happy. When Mrs. Zuckerman got through and rubbed him dry, he was the cleanest, prettiest pig you ever saw. Here's a picture of her giving him that buttermilk bath. He was pure white, pink around the ears and snout, and smooth as silk. The Zuckermans went up to change into their best clothes. Lurvy went to shave and put on his plaid shirt and his purple necktie. The animals were left to themselves in the barn. The seven goslings paraded round and round their mother. Please, please, please take us to the fair, begged a gosling. Then all seven began teasing to go. Please, 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 please. They made a racket. Children, snapped the goose. We're staying quietly, idly, idly in the home. Only Wilbur Ilber Ilber is going to the fair. Just then Charlotte interrupted. I shall go too, she said softly. I have decided to go with Wilbur. He may need me. We can't tell what may happen at the fairgrounds. Somebody's got to go along who knows how to write. And I think Templeton better come too. I might need somebody to run errands and do general work. I'm staying right here, grumbled the rat. I haven't the slightest interest in fairs. That's because you've never been to one, remarked the old sheep. A fair is a rat's paradise. Everybody spills food at the fair. A rat can creep out late at night and have a feast. In the horse barn, you will find oats that the trotters and pacers have spilled. In the trampled grass of the infield, you will find old discarded lunch boxes containing the foul remains of peanut butter sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, cracker crumbs, bits of doughnuts, and particles of cheese. In the hard-packed dirt of the midway, after the glaring lights are out and the people have gone home to bed, you will find a veritable treasure of popcorn fragments, frozen custard, dribblings, candied apples, abandoned by tired children, sugar fluff crystals, salted almonds, popsicles, partially gnawed ice cream cones, and the wooden sticks of lollipops. Everywhere is loot for a rat, in tents, in booths, in haylofts. Why, a fair has enough disgusting leftover food to satisfy a whole army of rats. Templeton's eyes were blazing. Is this true? he asked. Is this appetizing yarn of yours true? I like high living, and what you say tempts me. It is true, said the old sheep. Go to the fair, Templeton. You will find that the connections at a fair will surpass your wildest dreams. Buckets with sour mash sticking to them, tin cans containing particles of tuna, fish, greasy paper bags stuffed with rotten... That's enough! cried Templeton. Don't tell me any more. I'm going. Good, said Charlotte, winking at the old sheep. Now then, there is no time to be lost. Wilbur will soon be put into the crate. Templeton and I must get in the crate right now and hide ourselves. The rat didn't waste a minute. He scampered over to the crate, crawled between the slats, and pulled straws up over him so he was hidden from sight. All right, said Charlotte. I'm next. She sailed into the air, let out a drag line, and dropped gently to the ground. Then she climbed the side of the crate and laid herself inside a knot hole in the top board. The old sheep nod nodded. What a cargo, she said. That sign ought to say Zuckerman's favorite, famous pig and two stowaways. Look out, the pigs are coming, coming, coming. The people, sorry, are coming, coming, coming shouted the gander. Cheese it, cheese it, cheese it. The big truck with Mr. Arable at the wheel backed slowly down toward the barnyard. Lurvy and Mr. Zuckerman walked alongside. 
Fern and Avery were standing in the body of the truck, hanging on to the sideboards. Listen to me, whispered the old sheep to Wilbur. When they open that crate and try to put you in, struggle. Don't go without a tussle. Pigs always resist when they're being loaded. If I struggle, I'll get dirty, said Wilbur. Never mind that. Do as I say. Struggle. If you were to walk into the crate without resisting, Zuckerman might think that you were bewitched. He'd be scared to go to the fair. Templeton poked his head up through the straw. Struggle if you must, he said. But kindly remember that I'm hiding down here in this crate, and I don't want to be stepped on, or kicked in the face, or pummeled, or crushed in any way, or squashed, or buffeted around, or bruised, or lacerated, or scarred, or biffed. Just watch what you're doing, Mr. Radiant, when they get sho shoving you in. Be quiet, Templeton, said the sheep. Pull in your head. They're coming. Look radiant, Wilbur. Lay low, Charlotte. Talk it up, geese. The truck backed slowly to the pig pen and stopped. Mr. Arable cut the motor, got out, walked around to the rear, and lowered the tailgate. The geese cheered. Mrs. Arable got out of the truck. Fern and Avery jumped to the ground. Mrs. Zuckerman came walking down from the house. Everybody lined up at the fence and stood for a moment admiring Wilbur and the beautiful green crate. Nobody realized that the crate already contained a rat and a spider. Here's, uh, sorry, that's some pig, said Mrs. Arable. He's terrific, said Lurvy. He's very radiant, said Fern, remembering the day he was born. Well, said Mrs. Zuckerman, he's clean anyway. The buttermilk certainly helped. Mr. Arable studied Wilbur carefully. Yes, he is a wonderful pig, he said. It's hard to believe that he was the runt of the litter. You'll get some extra credit, um, extra good ham and bacon, Homer, when it comes time to kill that pig. Wilbur heard these two words, or heard these words, and his heart almost stopped. I think I'm going to faint, he whispered to the old sheep who was watching. Kneel down, whispered the old sheep. Let the blood rush to your head. Wilbur sank to his knees, all radiance gone. His eyes closed. Look, screamed Fern, he's fading away. Hey, watch me, yelled Avery, crawling on all fours into the crate. I'm a pig, I'm a pig. Avery's foot touched Templeton under the straw. What a mess, thought the rat. What fantastic creatures boys are. Why did I let myself in for this? The geese saw Avery in the crate and cheered. Avery, you get out of that crate this instant, commanded his mother. What do you think you are? I'm a pig, cried Avery, tossing a handful of straw into the air. Oink, oink, oink. The truck is rolling away, Papa, said Fern. The truck, with no one at the wheel, had started to roll downhill. Mr. Arable dashed to the driver's seat and pulled on the emergency brake. The truck stopped. The geese cheered. Charlotte crouched and made herself as small as possible in the knot hole so Avery wouldn't see her come, or wouldn't see her. Come at once. Come out at once, said Mrs. Arable. A Avery crawled out of the crate on hands and knees, mess uh, making faces at Wilbur. Wilbur fainted away. The pig has passed out, said Mrs. Zuckerman. Throw water on him. Throw buttermilk, suggested Avery. The geese cheered. Lurvy ran for a pail of water. Fern climbed into the pen and knelt by Wilbur's side. It's sunstroke, said Lurvy. Sorry, said Zuckerman. The heat is too much for him. Maybe he's dead, said Avery. Come out of that pig pen immediately, cried Mrs. Arable. Avery obeyed his mother and climbed into the back of the truck so he could see better. Lurvy returned with cold water and dashed it on Wilbur. Throw some on me, cried Avery. I'm hot, too. Oh, keep quiet, hollered Fern. Keep quiet. Her eyes were brimming with tears. Wilbur, feeling the cold water, came, too. He rose slowly to his feet while the geese cheered. He's up, said Mrs. Arable said Mr. Arable. I guess there's nothing wrong with him. I'm hungry, said Avery. I want a candied apple. Here's a picture of them splashing water on Wilbur. Need to make sure that's in there. Okay. <clears throat> 
I'm hungry, said Avery. I want a candied apple. Wilbur's all right now, said Fern. We can start. I want to take a ride in the Ferris wheel. Mr. Zuckerman and Mr. Arable and Lurvy grabbed the pig and pushed him headfirst toward the crate. Wilbur began to struggle. The harder the men pushed, the harder he held back. Avery jumped down and joined the men. Wilbur kicked and thrashed and grunted. Nothing wrong with this pig, said Mr. Zuckerman cheerfully, pressing his knee against Wilbur's behind. All together now, boys, shove! With a final heave, they jammed him into the crate. The geese cheered. Lurvy nailed some boards across the, the end. Um, nailed some boards across the end so Wilbur couldn't back out. Then, using all their strength, the men picked up the crate and heaved it aboard the truck. They did not know that under the straw was a rat, and inside a knot hole was a big gray spider. They saw only the pig. Everybody in, called Mr. Ar uh, yeah, Mr. Arable. He started the motor. The ladies climbed in beside him. Mr. Zuckerman had what? Mr. Zuckerman and Lurvy, and Fern and Avery rode in back, hanging on to the sideboards. The truck began to move ahead. The geese cheered. The children answered their cheer, and away went everybody to the fair. And that is where we're going to stop it for today. I hope you're enjoying the story. And, oh, I forgot to tell you. To tomorrow we are reading, uh, next time we're reading chapter 17, which is called Uncle. And the first word is when. So I hope that you're enjoying the reading. And yes, that's right, not tomorrow. It's probably going to be Sunday or possibly Monday, depending on how we I'm feel. Um, and God bless you guys. Y'all have a great uh, evening and a great weekend. And we'll see you again next time.